uh, to to the audience for today's session. I have uh, three uh, very uh, esteemed guests joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, Jonathan, who's joining us from Las Vegas in, in the US. Uh, Rupen Roy um, uh, joining us from Kolkata and Shibu joining us from Trivandrum. Um, I, I think we will uh, have someone else, uh, uh, Mr. Murthy uh, Nuni, joining us from Ho Chi Minh City as well. There he is. Hi, hi Murthy. Hi, good morning. So, sorry about the delay. No, 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 oh, no problem. <laughs> so we're all fine. We're, we're live, um, Murthy. So we'll get started with the theme uh, of today's conversation, which is really um, to kind of glean, I think, from the four of you, uh, your experiences, because most major economies and countries are at a fairly important inflection point, right? Um, there is hope of a economic recovery in the air, but we don't know when and how uh, that will that'll happen. Um, different countries are at different stages of the vaccination process. So building that kind of safeguard and security for the population at large is, of course, going to be a challenge. Um, and I know that each of you have your own perspectives of, of where, um, what you've seen. Um, Muti has a one leg in UK and he's currently based in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, Rupen, of course, um, has a is based in Kolkata, which has also seen uh, the pandemic kind of uh, impact the economy. And he also has uh, uh, family in the US and has been exchanging notes. Jonathan has a very clear first hand view of some of the challenges that um, the pandemic has posed to to a whole bunch of uh, sectors, particularly he's kind of very, very focused on on food and food safety and, and ensuring that um, people have access to food and we figure out interesting entrepreneurial ways of reducing wastage, which we'll talk about. And Shibu from his perch in Trivandrum has a very interesting view of the technology space and how that's kind of evolving. So I'll start with you, Murti. Um, you're on the one end of the spectrum, which is in Ho Chi Minh City. And you've been there, you said, for about a year and a half. Give us a perspective of what you're seeing um, right there and, and your base is in UK. So a little bit of that as well, maybe in a couple of minutes, just to set context. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm a private equity and public markets uh, investor, investment manager for the last 20, 20 23 years. I own Marshall Funds. Uh, so I used to live in Singapore for about 10 years, then I moved to London in 2010. Uh, so uh, my home base is London, uh, uh, but uh, over the last uh, five, six years, uh, uh, we are uh, investing in uh, renewable energy projects uh, in Asia, and uh, we started looking at projects in Vietnam. Uh, so we have been developing a couple of projects here uh, in, in offshore wind uh, and solar projects as well. So, uh, so I, I keep traveling back and forth between UK and, and Vietnam. Uh, so uh, early la last year, I uh, came here. And uh, then the pandemic hit in China first and uh, then everywhere else. Uh, so uh, as the pandemic keeps kept going up, uh, every, every other country was in deep trouble. But uh, Vietnam uh, managed the crisis extremely well. They've been very, very cautious. In the beginning, they had some cases coming from China because they, they have a very long border with China and, uh, the, and uh, by way of flights as well. So, but they immediately took very strong action and they closed the borders, they stopped the flights, which also meant that I couldn't go back to London. Um, I, I can only go back by uh, way of uh, uh, embassy arranged flights, uh, you know, repatriation flights. Uh, and if I want to come back, then it's going to be very, very difficult. <laughs> you know, it's a long, long process because uh, they are very careful about uh, people coming back into the country. Uh, again, through embassy range flights, which could be like once a month or something from the UK, once a month from India. Uh, so that so that was the situation. So, but, but because they managed the crisis so well, um, they they basically shut down their uh, tourist industry, which is a very big component of their economy. They've, they, they've taken the decision that uh, people's health is more important uh, and people should have normal lives. Uh, then, uh, you know, say, say no growth in the economy or anything like that. So, so they basically took a hit of 3% of their GDP growth. 
uh, by closing down the Cheetos University in some part of the business. Uh, but they had 3% growth, GDP growth last year, 2.5% to 3% GDP growth last year. And this year, uh, they're, they're planning, they're planning to have back to 5-6%. Um, so, 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 we, so we had, uh, for the last one to one and a half years, uh, we, we had an easy life here because uh, everything was very normal. Uh, but the pe- people comply here extremely well, like, uh, probably part of the communist culture or something like that. Uh, so, th- uh, you know, when the government says something, they all listen. So, so you will you will see that even though there's there's been no pandemic, people were around with face masks. So very much different from anywhere else in the world. Yes. <laughs> so that's uh, and, and they continued this, uh, you know, no flights policy. The, uh, there's a lot of foreign investment here from uh, Korea, Japan, uh, Singapore. Uh, particularly, this uh, Singapore Prime Minister has been uh, d- discussing with the Vietnam Prime Minister to open the flights, but he would say that uh, uh, you must get your cases back to zero, then we'll open the flights. So, <laughs> so that's that's been the case. Um, so, so, but over the last uh, two months, uh, some the Delta wave has started here. Uh, it has uh, come through some uh, repatriation flights which have come here, and uh, it got digged out through the quarantine uh, facilities. And uh, uh, it has gone to the special economic zones. So over the last two months, we are having some cases here. It's more, more like uh, uh, right now it's about four or five thousand cases. So they've tried, they've shut down the country. Basically, we are, we are having lockdowns in in Vietnam for the first time for the last one month. So we, we are back to the life uh, that, that that everyone else is enjoying around the world. Uh, right. And of course, uh, during this time, UK is having a completely different. Uh, uh, you know, Way of life, right? So they, they initially they were the first people they said who said uh, uh, we're going to try herd immunity. immunity. Nobody else heard about herd immunity. They started with herd immunity, and they all suffered very badly. The prime minister got hit with COVID, and uh, they they went from crisis to crisis. Uh, and they got their vaccination program uh, perfect, so uh, they they have the best vaccination rates, uh, uh, probably even better than the USA. Uh, but now uh, you know uh, Boris, John, Boris Johnson has decided to take more risk. And he's decided to open up the country, and suddenly his health minister is, is hit with COVID, and uh, he was asked he's asked to isolate. Uh, so, so we'll have to see uh, how interesting that's going to be. With, no, uh, no. So that's that's a very useful um, context because you're talking about two different countries with its own sets of challenges. One like Vietnam, which I think came out of it quite well initially, now has been kind of under the weather with because of the. Uh, Delta variant in some ways, um, yeah. and uh, UK, which has taken started taking a lot of risk, as you rightly said, uh, but is uh, poised at a very critical juncture. I'll come to you, Rupin, um, uh, because you've had you've been watching the scene in from your uh, observatory in Kolkata as well, and uh, what's going on in the US. What what are you seeing um, that that kind of gives you confidence, and at the same time makes you worry a bit. Yeah, uh, to set the scene, yeah. uh, you, as you all know that the IT industry, IT services industry where I have spent most of my uh, working life. Yes. And also I'm on the board of a US based company, which is headquartered in the US, but has offshore facilities in India. What I find is that the disruptor has been disrupted because our disruption model was that we made people electronically fungible. Right. Instead of body shopping, we said that, okay, we have an offshore facility which is going to do work on servers which are based in the US. Sure. So we made people electronically portable. Now, even in that model, the key thing was that at least 10%, 5 to 10% of the people had to be on site right. at the cloud to understand the requirements, to be close to the client, to un- everything could not be uh, put on paper sure. or any other digital uh, you know, form, format. But suddenly this part, pandemic, what it did was that it disrupted that model again. So the disruptor was disrupted. Right. We suddenly didn't have visa, we suddenly didn't have uh, travel and we had to on the fly change. Right. Now, after, uh, so we adapted to that and therefore uh, the offshore model had to be refined. Yes. Tools were developed. Meetings like this happened. Uh, we uh, made sure that uh, requirements definition was done off-site. 
But now we have a very interesting situation. The U.S. company that uh, I work for, uh, I'm, I'm on the board of, yes. they have been a lot of vaccine. As you know, this IT industry is very young industry. So yes. you know, uh, it was not 60 plus people who were taking vaccines uh, and therefore they, they counted. They were all young sure. people. Sure. But in the U.S., and I have uh, my family in the U.S., all of them are in the IT industry, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Pretty much everybody is vaccinated. So they are going back gradually to the hybrid model. Right. Whereby they're working from home, yeah. but when they need to go for a team meeting or they want to go to the office, they're going to do that. Yes. In India, the vaccination has not been that much. Yes. Therefore, getting back to the old normal yeah. has become very slow. Absolutely. And this disruption has impacted not just the pe poor people who work, but look at the other people who support. You know, the transporters have been impacted, the catering people have been impacted, commercial space has been impacted because people are working from home. Yes. So I think we are now uh, trying to cope with the new dynamic of the pandemic-led uh, offshore model. So uh, let us see how it works. But I think if you look at the outcome, if you look at TCS and Infosys and Wipro, they are hiring crazy. Yes. And the right. reason is that actually there has been growth in the industry. If you look at their share prices, if you look at their performance. So it, pandemic has been uh, obviously a very uh, bad thing for the country and the economy. But it has been a silver lining for the IT industry yeah. because more people are yeah. Yeah. cutting down cost and offshore. So that, that's my initial take. But I'll come back. Uh, yeah. And I'm guessing digitization and the pace of digitization would have considerably accelerated as well because of the pandemic. Absolutely. In fact, there is a book. I'll come back yeah. to the data. You know, no. the yeah, sure. Prasad has written a book on how money will disappear, <laughs> that money will be digitized. This is going to come out in September. He's right. a Cornell, Cornell University professor. That's so right. I think digitization has actually been, uh, has picked up a lot of pace. Yeah. Not by government action, yeah. but by a pandemic disrupted world. That's right. That's right. Thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan, I wanted to bring you in. Um, you've seen both ends. You've seen um, and you've been personally involved. And I would love to hear a little about your social entrepreneurship yeah. effort in the in the middle of this pandemic to try and kind of bring soccer to, to large swaths of people who were obviously impacted by the pandemic in quite horrific sort of ways. But what are you seeing around you that, that uh, gives us some uh, perspective of where we are today. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, great question. One of the biggest things we have to realize, not as many people are getting vaccinated as they should. Um, people are saying they are, but they're not. And this has become a huge problem here in the United States and across the country. I think it's, I know out here only 47 people, 40%, 47 percent of the people have been, become vaccinated. And this Delta variant um, it's getting in trouble. They've actually started bringing masks back and stuff like uh, different things like that, precautions, uh, because people just aren't listening. And this is where the issue is and what we have to really get the message out there. My biggest thing, what we found out really was the people that couldn't afford to survive or migrant workers or different people that need help, there was no food out there, even for active military, children. When schools close, a lot of children in the United States actually count on their meals at school, and especially on the weekends and stuff like that. There, there's no food, and so we really put got a lot of people together. And what happened was um, a lot of all the hotels had closed, all the arenas had closed, all the sports centers, everything had closed. So we had an abundance of food, but there was no way to get it out to people. So we started taking shipping containers and building full off-grid solar food pantries and putting it, strategically putting them in different locations and working with people. So instead of that food going to landfills or going to waste, we are able to house it and redistribute it. Um, some of the most wonderful things I found is how many people came together, how many people were very appreciative of it, um, but also realizing how much waste. I think that's one of the things we do, even without COVID, in the United States, we waste 50% of all the food. Um, in Florida alone, I believe they threw away last year over a billion pounds of fruits and vegetables. 
which can go to our children. I mean, we have over 13, when there's no COVID, 13, 14 million children that go to bed hungry every single day. Um, it's ridiculous. And we have the food. It's not like we don't have the food. And that leads to suicide lines. There's a lot more stuff, the cyberbullying that people don't get. So what we really try to do is bring people hope and help people thrive. And the way you do that is good food. Because the food that is distributed, instead of the fruits and vegetables and the dairy and the meat and all that stuff that gets thrown away, they give them processed food. So processed food makes people sicker. Yes. And um, people don't understand about we have to eat natural foods. Um, one thing we talked about, and I've said before, is like in the United States, we don't have health care. We have sick care. Right. You know, there's no preventative stuff. We're taking all this nutritious food and throwing it away instead of giving it to people. And I really want to do this around the world because I know, logistically and food-wise, the food's there. It's just getting it to the people and the people in need and teaching people. So one of the biggest things we had to do, because everybody was so confined during COVID, we got a lot of people that had just come out of jail or prison, and it was called Second Chance, Father to Child, different organizations. And we showed them how to do solar and how to do food distribution. And everybody that we worked with now has a full-time job. They've joined the unions or something like that. And well, one of the things we really focused on was community. Going into a community... Because as I'm here speaking with you, I know in New York or I know in Georgia or California, people are being fed. That was my biggest concern because all of us together, we can work and we can help people. But if we walk away and they stop doing it, what have we really accomplished? It's going to go back. And hoping with COVID and stuff that people are going to start learning that we have to work together we have to learn from what we were doing. Um, and we have to come become a community. I, I really believe around the world, we forgot what community is. Very People nice. don't even know their neighbors anymore, you know? Yeah. So that was one thing I was able to do and still into people and really work with that when I leave, you've got to continue this because yeah. I can't be every day, there every day. And it's been amazing that people show up now and they help their communities and I, I really think this could be a global thing that we can work together. But we have to teach people to take care of themselves, to take care of their communities. You know, and, and I really believe the pandemic. I mean, when I was doing this, I was feeding my whole neighborhood because I was getting access to so much food and stuff. At first, people were getting very upset with me because they thought, like, oh, what do you think? I'm poor. I can't afford food. And I'm like, this is going to be thrown away. And I'm talking about give people milk and juices and sandwiches, chickens, and all this stuff. And some people got offended in the beginning until they started realizing I wasn't doing this because for any other reason than to help. You know, so that was interesting, too, because people, like, you want to help me? I don't need help. We have it all under control. We're not poor, you know. So, um, and, I, and just work, talking with you guys and learning so much more, I just think we really basically need to come together. I think it's very important. And... The only way we're really going to get out of this is work together and teach people to thrive. And then, because right now, with health and everything, it's not getting better. Things might shut down again. Yeah. And then people are going to be like, what do we do? You know? Yeah. yeah. So, so you yeah. put the power back in the hands of the people. The, yes. the point you make about communities is very well taken. And can that be made into a global movement that, that helps bring sucker to the people and they can help themselves in some yeah. ways? And they will, um, because yeah. if you give people, sorry, real quick, if you just, yeah. if you give people a sense of purpose, yeah. you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, you know, people work the system, you know, how do you do that? Well, you get somebody that you're serving or you're helping and say, hey, can you please help me? In their hearts, they feel joy. They, they're like, you want me to help? And then they, they're, they're the first person to grab a broom. They're the first person to grab the table to clean up, to help. So we have to give people hope and a sense of purpose. Yeah. Sure. So Shibu, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, you heard Jonathan talk about community. You talked, I mean, he's also talked about capacity building in some ways um, in the community itself so that the, the capabilities uh, continue to reside in the community and how do you scale that? Uh, you've had an interesting career as well. Tell us a little about your own background and what you're seeing from 
um, the fantastic state of Kerala, which is also considered a role model in some ways of a community kind of centric healthcare model. Um, Shibu? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, I was in the Navy. I was a naval architect before I, I you know, started on uh, this new dimension of life. So now basically, uh, we uh, look at ourselves as a software company, which also runs a uh, co-working space. So from the uh, software company, we do services and products. And uh, at the co-working space, we are able to have a first-hand look at uh, innovation as well. So some of those innovations we try to bring back into the things that we do. And uh, so we have uh, got a model like that. So, uh, I mean, as far as Kerala is concerned, I think uh, a lot of things are out there. Uh, they've done pretty decently in being able to contain the uh, COVID uh, spread. So the COVID spread has kind of plateaued right now. So, uh, But the good thing is that uh, nobody ever uh, went uh, in need of a hospital bed. The hospital beds are always available. They continue to remain available. I think the occupancy rates run around 50 to 60 percent uh, from the beginning, uh, even going now. So that that's a good part. So there was no shortage of oxygen and things like that. As far as the uh, IT industry is concerned, uh, basically I uh, I'm, I'm in the one of the southernmost parts of India. Right. Uh, so basically, we have around hundred thousand odd IT workers here. It's got a good. Uh, uh, decent outsourcing uh, market. Uh, the good thing is there is an international airport which connects to the rest of the part of the world. Uh, so uh, the the IT industry, like uh, Rupen had brought out, is uh, growing year on year. So we've also seen quite a good growth. Uh, the IT industry per se has grown around seven to eight percent. The Indian IT industry, and it continues to grow. Uh, we we uh, we are primarily in the healthcare sector. And uh, we've seen uh, good uptake in the uh, care sector as well. Right. right. So, so fair enough. Uh, I think all of you have given us a good overview of what you're seeing from your uh, current, um, you know, standpoint. And and the the thing to understand is where does this game now shift? What are our options? What are the things that we ought to be focused on now? I think Jonathan spoken about a few in terms of how to empower communities where we'll drill a little deeper in terms of uh, to get business and the economy uh, back on track. What are the things that we may need to think about from a slightly more systemic kind of view or at a firm level or at an ecosystem level? Uh, Rupen, do you want to kind of uh, take a stab at what you would paint yes, as uh, the priorities? I would do that and then, of course, uh, I would request uh, my co-panelist, Jonathan, to explain very briefly how his model, because he's got solar powered refrigeration. Uh, we've got a company called, uh, organization called Robin Hood Army, which uh, dis redistributes food yes. to the poor. How is that model, you know, is it, is it, has it got relevance and can we cooperate between India and, and his company? But yeah. coming to your question, uh, yeah. I think uh, the single biggest differentiator would be vaccination yeah. because uh, hopefully by 15th of August we will cross 500 million. Now, we would have uh, preferred to have 100% uh, of our population vaccinated overnight, but that's a utopia. Yes. Uh, we uh, had some initial issues with the availability of vaccines, but now I think uh, our repertoire of vaccines have increased. We could new vaccines coming in. So I think that is going to be a single big differentiator. But then again, because of the mutation of viruses and the uh, Delta, Delta Plus, uh, Lambda and whatnot, we will still have to have some COVID appropriate behavior going forward. Right. We just can't throw all caution to the winds. Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. see uh, how it happens in the UK. Right. Because they seem to have gone into a normal mode. Um, hopefully things will work out there, but if it does not, I think it's better to have caution. Yeah. But uh, the hybrid model will definitely uh, start coming in from September in India, and it has already started in, in elsewhere, in UK and the US, etc. The IT companies have announced Rupin last week that yeah. they're starting to open up. Yeah, um, but they probably only, will not work uh, yeah. five days a week, but that's right. 
they will and, and out from what i understood from the communicate it's optional for people if yeah. they want to work out of campus they have the option of coming there yeah so right. uh, i think that is going to also have a ripple effect because for every person that is employed in the it industry three or four are in the support yeah they are also very important because their livelihoods depend on on this industry sure but in consulting is much more interaction with people yes. which is not offshore yes uh, you know companies like deloitte pricewaterhouse accenture yes. others who i talk talk to mckinsey they have also started uh, you know meeting people uh, having uh, client meetings etc so hopefully in the next 2 3 months we will see an uptick but so sure. broader economy uh, i think manufacturing is back because uh, most of the manufacturing units are working uh, at, at uh, near full capacity Yeah. So uh, I am very optimistic. Unless a third wave cripples us, I think the worst that we have seen is over and behind us. But yeah. we have to be cautious in opening up. Uh, we should not throw caution to the winds. Yeah. Uh, because we are uh, a very large country with uh, diverse population, and not like a small country like UK, which is vaccinated so many people so quickly. Yeah. yeah. So. Let us let us hope that we will open up with uh, caution and uh, keep uh, correcting our course as we go oh, forward. And oh. Indian economy, uh, by all accounts, is going to grow in yeah. the next next yeah. next. Uh, that, that, at least that's the hope. If if uh, yeah. if we don't get derailed, uh, Murthy, I'd come to you. Um, Rupen was talking about uh, vaccination both in programs in UK as well as in India. We've picked up pace, of course. Um, UK has done a phenomenal job, but in Vietnam, I. from what i i heard from you last time that's been a challenge uh, and therefore the options that you have before you are to some extent uh, limited uh, am i correct in assuming that yeah absolutely so uh, because uh, the country had uh, such a good success in uh, managing the pandemic uh, they uh, did not focus uh, on vaccination which is a, which is actually a wrong thing they started developing their own vaccination actually they basically they they started doing their trial tests and all that for some vaccination locally developed vaccination and uh, it it is not going anywhere so now, now that the delta wave has come here and uh, they they're having about 4 5000 cases a day in in, in a 100 billion population it's not very much but it's too much for them so the Uh, they have started. They are they are completely locking down several parts of the country right now, uh, and trying to get it under control. Uh, but they they are finding that uh, Delta wave is uh, difficult to control. You know because uh, a lot of people are working in closed uh, atmospheres and uh, special economic zones and uh, big industrial houses. There are a lot of big industries here. Samsung has has the largest, world's largest facility uh, in Vietnam. Uh, employing about 200,000 people, and many they are in many special economic zones here. Each, each factory with about 20,000 people, 50,000 people. So they they work in close proximity. So they 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 are finding difficult to control Delta wave. They are actually having a work in a live-in factory uh, atmosphere here. So basically, they they are telling workers that uh, you cannot leave the factory. You have to live here. They are giving them tents to live in the factory, so wow. so that. they don't get exposed to covid uh, you know they just live in the factory and they get tested every day so they make taking these extreme measures uh, but basically the, the problem is the, is the vaccination so now they are running around trying to scrapping for vaccination from everywhere so they 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 i think they're pretty much secure the, the uh, 100 million doses or something which they require uh, by in the next three months so they they are Um, you know, uh, running around doing, doing it really, really quickly, uh, but 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 basically, without vaccination, you can't do anything now, nowadays. You can't travel, right? Just yeah, so, uh, that's right. I can't, I can't go back to the UK without without vaccination. And vaccination not available here. So, but but I think they'll get it sorted out. Um, but uh, even with the vaccination, you know, what you're having in the in the UK is uh, they, they've started something called a ping demic, which is like uh, uh, you, you get a ping if you get exposed to. Uh, a covid positive person and they and they then you have to isolate so they're finding that uh, a lot of people are going into isolation because every every day they're having like 50000 cases a day in, in the uk which is right. very very still the highest right. one of the highest in the world uh, but people are not hosp- getting hospitalized or not dying because most of them are actually vaccinated but still they still getting impacted and the ping made ping demic expects that they isolate so suddenly they're finding that they are not having workers the The cold stores are not having people. The drivers are not there because they they've been pinged somewhere. Uh, workers, the factories are not showing up because they are they're getting pinged. Uh, but all, all this means that uh, there there is uh, going to be shortage. Shortages, you know, demand has suddenly gone up everywhere uh, for everything. 
uh, and there, there are these the problems of uh, supply constraints and uh, you know supply chain constraints uh, and delivery constraints. So, so, so basically, there, there is going to be shortages for quite a, quite a long time to come, and that's something that India has to manage as well because yes. shortages means uh, inflation. Inflation hits the poor people. So, how, how do we make sure that uh, the poor people are not, are not impacted by this? Uh, I think the agriculture says we're doing very well in India, but uh, the, uh, how is the distribution going to happen? So, yeah. in, so in this current situation, uh, to make sure that uh, poor people and people in need are not not impacted, that is that is the next big challenge of the government and uh, uh, the agencies in, in India. No, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up the whole issue of inflation because that's really I mean a very very critical variable going forward because if it spirals out of control, um, that really does affect the poorest sections of of the peop of people. Um, I'll come to you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I think uh, we've been discussing COVID appropriate behavior. I know that there is a very strong an anti-vax kind of lobby at work as well in the US. Um, and, and there's reluctance to wear face masks and all of that. So to your point about COVID uh, to instill kind of community centric, appropriate community centric behaviors, what, what are we missing a trick or two? Or is this something which is deep-seated and difficult to dislodge? Yeah, um, no, it's a great question. Yeah, no, it's difficult. Um, we have so much, uh, the United States is run by social media, by politics, by people just spew this information and people are dying. You know, I, I have more friends now that have not been vaccinated who have got COVID. And they're like, they're blown away by it. And, and the thing is, we have to get out the right information and people need to get vaccinated. You have to. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's, it's such a fight between people, but there's, it's going to get so much worse before it gets better because people aren't listening. They're, they're listening to people that don't know. They're not listening to the science. They're not looking at the data. They follow fucking heads. A lot of the stuff that we have in the States now, we don't have news. We have people's opinions. Right. So I look for, when I look at the news, I look for news in different parts of the world. Yeah. I just want to know what's going on. Yeah. You know, out here we have a lot of people's opinions. And um, it, it's really hard. It, it, because there's people that you care about. Yeah. And they're so adverse to the vaccine. And because they hear all this nonsense. And... Um, and some of these people run big companies, and they're very intelligent people, and yet they're endangering so many people, you know, and, and it's really hard, and it's hard for me to deal with, and but we have to, you know. But one thing I want to talk about real quick is the economic growth. One of the things that we've learned, we're now working with different states to build factories to bring people back to jobs and stuff with the, the solar units and stuff like that. Um, but we're not going to get back and places aren't going to be able to open until we get more vaccine, people more careful. You know, I was on the front lines all of last year. I, from the homeless to the military, I wore my mask, I washed my hands, I never got COVID. And I was there with people on the streets, you name it, people that, and you know, they said, oh, in America, the homeless weren't getting COVID. They were getting COVID and dying. You know, it's just, you know, they don't have names, the faces and stuff like that. But it's common knowledge, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands. I'm vaccinated, and yet I still go out now and wear a mask because I don't know about this Delta variant. I don't know who's telling me the truth or who's not being telling me the truth, who's being honest. You know, and, and that's one thing we have to teach people. That they have to start worrying about other people's lives. It's not just about them. You know, and that's the thing. They're, they're, it's about them. It's, no, who are they going to affect? Would they go see their family? And it's a shame that me being vaccinated, doing everything right, I have to go back and wear a mask now because I don't know who's lying to me telling me the truth. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Jonathan, I wanted to kind of focus on the question that I think uh, Rupen had raised, saying that if we were to transpose the idea that you kind of uh, worked on uh, to ensure yes. security uh, and to move it to our kind of environments, emerging market environments, what would it take? What are two or three things that we need to keep in mind? So that at least we so can that, learn something from them. Yeah. Right. So when you work with the large food distribution companies, that's where it starts. They have all this abundance, the supermarkets, the 
we have Cisco Foods here. I don't know if you have them out there, Abu. Your food distribution, it's really chain of command. So as long as you have an infrastructure, like what we do with these off-grid refrigerations that I know I can monitor to keep it at a certain temperature, people will be more apt to give you to give you food and to help. So it's really having that infrastructure because they have the deeper pockets. So like in the United States, a $50 billion company like Cisco trusts me with food and because they know I'm going to keep it safe. And they know from me that it goes out to the next set of people. It's really keeping that logistics. That's why they just can't give it to somebody who has no cold storage and the food goes oh. bad. Who you, you're going to go and sue the $50 billion company. Sure. You know? So it's really about washing your hands. Again, even without COVID, we have to teach people. We're building a whole iPad thing. Wash your hands before you touch food. Basic things. And then you will see how many more people will come to you to help. And I'd love to do whatever I can to help you and to build these solar containers or show you out there what to do with solar. I see you have all the wind towel towers out there, so you know about um, you know, off grid. Our thing is if there's a natural catastrophe, we can store food. The only way our food would go bad is if there's complete darkness for three days. And I'm talking so with snow all that we're okay and we can keep it cold and monitor it and that's what the most important thing how you're going to get people to help you is you're going to say we've got this under control because that's the biggest fear of most of these big companies is they're going to get sued people are going to go after them you know and I'd love to help you guys with that. I know all the temperatures I, if you give me the big companies I can we can assure them that the food will go to the right people be safe. Interesting. Thank you for that perspective. Murti, I'll come to you um, and then to Rupen as well. I think we may have lost Shibu for a bit. But Murti, if you were to kind of pick one or two levers that you would kind of press right now to get the economy back on track and especially given where you are, uh, you were talking about investing in renewable energy projects and all of that. Uh, what is really giving you hope? Um, what are the levers that you reckon uh, the country ought to focus on to, to get things back on track and what lessons could perhaps exist for India as well, I mean, from what, what you're seeing. Right. Uh, one, one of the outcomes of for this uh, crisis uh, has been uh, is a serious uh, focus on environment. Uh, so I think uh, all the several governments and, uh, uh, you know, the, in, in, the agencies which are into interest and impact uh, are now focused on uh, uh, climate change issues, uh, may, making sure that uh, the, this global warming, uh, sea levels going up everywhere, uh, catastrophes happening all over the world, uh, including yes. Germany. I mean, for the first time, Germany had yeah. huge floods. You, you never heard of the people dying in Germany for, 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 the for, for floods. Uh, and, and then you are, you're having... Uh, these uh, forest fires everywhere, uh, and uh, forest fires are basically burning down these uh, electrical system, and uh, the, you know there, there is power shortages even in uh, big countries and uh, you, you know, economies like the California and, and uh, the, you know big, big economies in the big states in the USA. Uh, so the uh, so the climate has become a big focus. Uh, the uh, Biden administration has come in, and uh, there, there is huge amount of funds uh, being allocated for climate change issues. Uh, and uh, there is a focus on on fossil fuels uh, completely getting scratched from the system. Uh, so we, we are seeing uh, in, in Vietnam, the, uh, the country had uh, traditionally a huge amount of uh, hydropower because of the rivers passing through from China to the south. Uh, but all the hydropower uh, potential is over now. So now the, any new energy has to come through renewable energy. Uh, because uh, fossil fuels are not getting funded by international banks and, and others anymore. Uh, and uh, the, the, this country requires uh, uh, at least the power generation capacity has to double uh, because of the growth. Uh, this is one of the few countries with uh, double-digit growth in electricity power generation demand. Uh, so the power generation capacity has to go up from 50 gigawatt uh, to 100 gigawatt by 2030, and all the new capacity has to come from, come from renewable energy. So that that's one of the reasons uh, I, I'm uh, focused in renewable energy in, in Vietnam right now. 
Awesome. And with all the concepts of ESG, of course, I mean, uh, investing, that's kind of dominating the, the investing landscape as well. We keep hearing that again and again. And, I, and I, I'm guessing that's a reality for you, for sure. I, I, absolutely. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of interest now from, yeah. from the international investors in the, in the US and Europe. Uh, wanting right. to in Asia, uh, in renewable energy uh, in uh, all Asian countries, uh, India as well as uh, uh, Indonesia, where we are uh, Philippines. Of course, uh, China has done a tremendous job. They are, they are installing the maximum amount of renewable energy in the world. Right. Uh, so, they, uh, but the, that is a big focus, I think. Uh, and uh, one thing, one of the outcomes of any, any of these pandemics that we've seen in the past uh, is that uh, immediately after the panic, pandemic, uh, people become restless because they've not done anything for a couple of years, and the risk-taking ability suddenly goes up. And uh, maybe that's that's what you're seeing. Uh, we've seen in India this week, you know, the, the Zomato, the big listing that has happened. Uh, that, that, that it has done so well uh, because of. Uh, uh, retail investors, uh, yes. even four or five years ago, a loss making company could not be listed in the Indian stock exchanges uh, because there was just not really, there, there was no risk, risk appetite and uh, the, uh, the regulators wouldn't allow it. Uh, suddenly, uh, uh, you know, regulators want this company to get listed and we retail want to invest in this company and they are prepared to pay up more than the, you know, 50% premium to the institutional investors what, what they pay. Uh, but that's just one, one example that's happening all over the world. You know, so, uh, suddenly you're, you're getting new economies being created like uh, this uh, crypto and uh, uh, Bitcoin and, and the, you know, space tourism, <laughs> so something, uh, something which you never thought existed before. Uh, suddenly yeah. you are finding applications for these things. And this has happened after every pandemic in the world. You know, the maximum amount of innovation has happened uh, after, after the, uh, in the first... Uh, you. You've given us a perfect segue. Um, and I want to come to you, Shibu, and then Rupen as well, on the point that um, Murthy was making about innovation. And, and uh, so uh, if you were to look at uh, post-pandemic um, and, and look at the technology industry in India and, and what they need to do to become and, and kind of encourage the more, build the innovative capacity, really, in some ways. What are some of the things that you're noticing that might um, be encouraging and useful to, for us to pause and consider? Shibu, starting with you, from an innovation uh, lens. That's, that's a good question, because if you see uh, the Indian IT industry, even though it's like uh, bringing in around 50% of FDI into the country, it is primarily kind of an outsourcing service kind of an industry. So now we see with the startup culture and the ecosystem which is really coming up, that innovation has come to the forefront. Classical case is like something like Muthi just brought out about the Zomato listing, uh, which is like an essentially like a product company. So there are uh, many uh, startups which have, uh, you know, really coming of age. There are many of these uh, innovative products which are really hitting the market. And then uh, I can see it when I'm running a co-working space, even in a small place. Yes. Uh, there are many people who come up with uh, such innovative things, uh, which are uh, really, uh, which which uh, which is not possible to, you know, think of in the normal fear of uh, how these guys are going to explode into the market at the later stage. That's right. So, and, and and as far as the, the, the other critical thing was that uh, one of the points Rupen was bringing out, that even when the pandemic hit, as an IT industry, uh, oh, we, we, we had to innovate, you know, at a rapid pace to come to the new normal. For example, if you see the uh, BPM industry, the uh, business process uh, or the call centers, you know, they are as per law, they were not allowed to work from home. There was a quick transition to work from home and many of the PPM and call center guys, they put in a lot of uh, innovative things in place. Like for example, the moment you log on, the camera also switches on. Yeah. Similarly, uh, with many of the ODCs here, the ODCs also had to put in a lot of innovative technologies into play to make sure that the data is safe and uh, make sure that the work that is being done is safe and uh, those kind of things. Yeah, Shibu, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we've kind of completely run out of time today. Uh, Ruben, I would love to get your perspective on digitization and, and what, the, what the impacts are likely to be, but uh, we're absolutely 
completely right. run out of time but uh, in 30 seconds do you want to kind of provide some perspective I'll, of, I'll, I'll, yeah. in 30 seconds i'll tell you that you know i am on the board of i am calcutta's innovation park yes and last week we did a 7 hour session where csr money from the private sector is getting funneled into innovation where the private sector company which is providing the uh, corporate social responsibility funds it also engaged in the joint incubation and yes. these are non it companies you know yes. one was an effluent disposal yes. so i think this is a new uh, uh, wave of innovation that is going to yes. come funded by csr yeah so which this is kind of open innovation where shibu was talking about startups really yeah. offering new ways of working and right. the most interesting things usually happen at the fringes jonathan gave us a brilliant example from the yeah. us of what the work he's doing and if that can travel across borders then yeah. there may well be hope um you murthy you spoke about the environment and how critical that's becoming right and that's um, again gives us hope that post pandemic we might end up with a better world right with that kind of i'm going to have to thank all our panelists rupen jonathan murthy and dibu for your perspective and wisdom and hopefully the audience would have benefited as well thank you so much thank bye you. bye thank you. all the best bye bye bye, bye. bye.